So hi, everybody. This is our Learn at Home webinar series from the University of Rhode Island College of the Environment and Life Sciences and URI Cooperative Extension. Today, we're going to learn about vegetable gardening as it relates to how to make sure we are following food safety practices. And we're going to hear from Sue Scotty, um, who took the Master Gardener course in 2004 and since has become a leader for us. In addition to her work as a leader in the vegetable greenhouse, where she is responsible for a lot of the donations of vegetables that we're able to give out to school gardens and various um, charities and nonprofits in the community. She is also, there's another hat where she has worked in the past for the Department of Environmental Management, helping them with their food safety um, program for farmers. So not only is she a vegetable gardener at home and a master gardener, helps us, um, with vegetable growing in the community, but she also does this um, professionally. So Sue, we can go right ahead to the next slide. Great. And so again, this is brought to you by Cooperative Extension, and you may know that there is a land grant university in every state in the United States, and URI is ours. That means that we are charged with bringing research based from the university system out to the communities who need them in all of these various areas that you see on the left hand side. Um, our guiding principles are that we're all about helping people improve their quality of life, um, their livelihoods and the health of our natural environment. And of course, we believe in social justice and we are always trying to create experiences for participants in the community that address diverse stakeholder needs. Thank you. A few housekeeping notes before we get started um, is thank you in advance for please completing the brief survey that's going to be sent to you in email um, once we're completed with this webinar. We do read all of the survey responses and they help us um, show the impact that this webinar series is having on the community and it's a ton of work. So we appreciate all of your feedback on it um, so that we can keep improving and keep um, meeting our mission as we mentioned earlier. Again, there will be a recording of this webinar in the URI Cooperative Extension YouTube channel posted and you can access that um, within a week usually, but you can see all of the other workshops. There have been a number on vegetable gardening and fruit growing so far from various faculty and master gardeners. So you can check those out on our YouTube channel. Okay, <laughs> we're ready to go. Um, so basically today we're going to be talking about food safety in the garden, a little bit about garden setup, um, planning, composting manure, harvesting and storage. Um, so why do we need to think about food safety? Well, if, if you look at what the food charts have done over the years, in, in 1994, we were really thinking that, you know, we should have all these you know, starches and things like that in our diets, and in the middle was our vegetables. Um, now that it's 2011 and 2020, we're getting into really fresh vegetables. That's the major part of our um, diets these days, and, you know, think about the raw diet and things like that. Um, so really, we need to start thinking about our vegetables as ready to eat foods. Um, you know, you have your sandwich, you have your apple, you have your broccoli, we're eating things raw, we're not cooking them the way we used to. Um, foodborne illnesses, uh, there's 48 million a year, um, 3,000 deaths, sounds like nothing, these things, right, with COVID. Um, but we don't want to be losing anybody. Um, we look at the culprits, you know, everybody always blames the seafood, uh, it's a seafood. Um, but produce causes the majority of the illnesses. Um, it's salad bars, it's the fresh foods, it's things getting contaminated, um, and really your fish and shellfish um, are quite a bit less. Um, luckily, we're not top on guests, I guess. So, what makes you sick? You know, you remember what you had last night for, for your meal. Um, the incubation periods for some of these viruses is really long. Um, you know, norovirus with the 12 to 48 and the mysteria down at the bottom there, three to 70 days. I mean, do you remember what you ate two months ago? 
Um, so really, that's part of what's hard with vegetable um, and tracking foodborne illnesses is that it can be such a long time. So maybe only a few people get sick. It's really only you know, we know about it when a lot of people get sick. Um, and that's not good. We don't want anybody to get sick. Um, people who are most at risk, infants and children, pregnant women, elderly, you know, they're getting the dub double whammy this year. Um, so we really want to make sure that the things that we're growing, uh, people need food right now, but we want to make sure that it's as safe as possible um, to make sure that the people who are at risk and everybody else are receiving a safe product. So again, what are our challenges when it comes to food safety? We're eating this food, a lot of it we're eating raw. We're not cooking it. So right there, we're not, we don't have that kill step. Um, the contamination is really difficult to remove once it's there. So we want to be looking for it and not using uh, foods that have been contaminated. Um, the openings, the scars, bruises and cuts, rough surfaces like these cantaloupes that are shown can be really hard to clean. We say, well, that's on the outside, but what do we do? We take our knife and we cut through that. Our knife has now been exposed to us on the outside of the vegetable and we brought it to the inside where it really likes it. Um, it, can, it multiplies, you know, even faster um, once we cut things. So it's really important that after we've cut into the foods that we take care of them properly. So what are some potential sources of contamination in the garden? Uh, pretty much everywhere. So soil, water, manure, your compost, wild and domestic animals, ourselves, um, our personal hygiene, um, our harvest containers, our water, our tools that we use, um, how are we handling things after? Um, so really looking at your gardening from the start all the way through to make sure that we're being safe at every single step. Um, so what about if it's organic? What about it if it's conventional? Really, there's when we're talking about food safety, there's no difference. Um, things like E. coli and salmonella, they're organic, you know? So really it's, it, you know, with organic, you don't get some of the man-made fertilizers and pesticides that maybe you don't want in your food, but there's just as much risk for uh, food illness as far as um, coming from bacteria and that sort of thing. So really it's all the same things that we need to be doing, whether you're organic or whether you're conventional. First thing you want to do is kind of look at, uh, if it's a new garden, um, definitely want to look a lot at your site assessment. If it's an old garden, maybe take a step back, take a look at, at where you're set. Um, do you have access to clean water? What's in your soil? What used to be in your soil? Um, is there, are you planting on top of things? Um, if you're closer to your house, it makes weeding and harvesting and all those things a lot easier, but maybe that's not the best place. Um, what's up the street or up the stream? Um, where's your compost going to be located? It should be uphill, not downhill. Um, think about runoff and things like that. Um, think about your sun. You know, do, am I going to get the sun that I need to grow the vegetables um, properly? Make sure that you're looking at what happens in the summer. Um, if you're looking at your site in the spring before the leaves come out, uh, your shade is going to dramatically change if you have trees. So really taking a look at what it does throughout the entire season. Um, full sun is best for vegetables. Um, some of your root crops can take some shade and they'll be okay. Um, but really, most vegetables really like it. And it's right. They'll take as much sun as they can get. Um, test your soil. So, you have any heavy metals? Again, knowing what was in your soil beforehand, and you might not know. Maybe it's a new development, and, and you don't know what was under there. You don't know how much stuff they buried while they were doing construction. What are your nutrient levels? What's your pH? Um, get to know your soil. Rhode Island's um, native soil tends to be a little bit more on the acidic side. Um, 
our plants as far as vegetables go like it uh, slightly acidic but um they prefer it six to 6.5 seven is neutral um you or i master gardeners at some point i don't know if, vanessa if you want to pop in here and, and is there any uh testing going to be going on this year um hopefully starting again in the fall but we haven't confirmed that yet so we will put that on our website but at this time yukon and i think umass just opened back up as well okay good so we have the uh the soil test site there and again this is being taped so that will be um on you even if you don't get it down right now uh to send out a soil test to yukon um and hopefully we'll be doing ph tests again in the fall so what kind of garden soil does it like? It likes well-drained, rich in organic matter, loosen it up. At least for the first year, you really wanna make sure that it's, it's all going together. A lot of people like to use um, a no-till or something after that, and that's fine. Make sure you're getting drainage, add compost, um, and try to maintain that soil um, and the health of the soil, really. Um, vegetable gardens like water. Okay, water is a huge area for making sure that it's safe. Um, if you're on wells, you should definitely test at least once a year. And I would test before um, you start getting into your harvest season. If you're using a lot of water on your garden, it's amazing how quickly um, something can happen to a well. You really need to make sure you're testing. Public water, you know, we're good with that. Um, they should be letting you know <laughs> if there's any issues. Uh, surface water, lakes, streams, ponds, really not recommending that for the home gardener at all. Um, it's just really difficult to know what the levels of E. coli and other bacteria are in your ponds without constant testing. Um, it really can vary. Same thing as like the lakes and stuff when they, you know, they test them, the EM tests them and says that they're not good for swimming or whatever. I and mean, that can really happen. The bloom happens relatively quickly, so we don't recommend surface water at all um, for the vegetable gardens. And, and I don't have this on the slide, but we also don't recommend rain barrels. Rain barrels are great for collecting things and for using on your ornamentals, but think of where that water is coming from. Most rain barrels are collecting draining off of the roof. Um, the water sits there. So even if you have something to keep mosquitoes and stuff out, you're, you're collecting the chemicals from the root, you're collecting the bird poop, you're collecting the squirrel poop or whatever else that water is running through before it gets to your barrel. It's really important that you don't use rain barrel water on your vegetable gardens, on, on any edible. Um, clean water is also needed for you know applying fertilizers, washing your hands, in your harvest so again it should be potable water that you're using um you want it to be as fresh as possible um water is a great carrier for bacteria um so you really want to make sure that your water source is not your issue best way to irrigate um is with drip we can't all do that um but it is a, a strictly drip under plastic that really keeps the water to the roots of the plant, which is good for them, and it reduces the splash on the edible portion of the plant, which could contain the pathogens from the soil um, that would then get on the edible portions. Um, again, you want you don't want E. coli in the water that you're you know feeding to your plants either. Um, and some of our screens out there. So again, uh, you know whatever you can do uh, to minimize splash up. Watch after big uh thunderstorms like we're going to be getting this weekend or this afternoon um really take a look at uh lettuce plants and that sort of thing for how much do they need to be washed if they get a lot of splash up and that sort of stuff in general in the demo garden we don't wash at the garden um because it's hard to get it dry and then you're putting it in a bag and you're bringing it and you don't want it to mold and that sort of thing so we don't wash unless they're really dirty but we do label everything that they should be washed before use um so again depending on if you're working in a demo garden where where's your produce going who is your who's your end consumer is it you is it is it the food bank um 
Is it your, you know, elderly parents? Is it your young children? Um, so keep that all in mind when you're thinking through the process. Um, gardens, uh, I love this picture because this is like the quintessential. Oh my gosh, it's my homestead, and and I have my chickens running around, and my beautiful vegetables, and all that kind of stuff. Well, um, yeah, the chickens might eat some bugs, but they also leave a, a lot of poop and raw manure around, and that is really bad. Chickens um, really have a lot of salmonella and other things that you just don't want in your garden. Same thing with your pets; you really should keep them out. Um, any livestock like your chickens and wild animals, we'll talk a little bit about that. You want to keep them out as best you can. Um, and then you want to be aware if they do get it. Um, have they left messes in your garden? Uh, did it get on the vegetables? Do you need to, you know, if the, if it did, you need to not be using those vegetables. Um, the other thing to look at would be uh, birds fly over, um, bird poop in the garden. Um, if it's on the tomato, the tomatoes, you know, it's no longer in play. Um, it needs to go away. Things soak into vegetables and just, you know, when you wash things, then it just spreads it. Just you're better off if you know it's there. Just don't use it. Um, garden should also be located away from your well caps. Um, you don't want anything to, <laughs> you're using a well. The last thing you want to do is infect your well. So you want to make sure that it's not getting the fertilizers in it. It's not getting your compost in it. It's not attracting animals. Um, garbage can, septic system. You know, the grass is always greener over the septic system. Uh, well, there's a reason for that, and it's not a good one. Um, you just don't want to, again, be, you know, putting your garden over the weeds here. Um, well, what's the risk? Animal feces um, from deer, uh, birds, rats, all those wonderful animals that can get out there. So you want to do everything that you can to try to prevent them. Really for deer, fencing is the best option. And I know it's hard. It needs to be tall. Um, they can jump six plus feet. So you know if you do not have at least a six foot fence, it's really not going to do anything. Um, again, just do the best you can. I, there's you know a lot of different tools out there. Some of them work for a while. And then the animals get used to them. You know, my deer sit there and, and they stare at my dog. Um, they know where his fence ends and they, you know, have stared at. Him. So, you know, you would hope that that would keep them away. Does it? Not always. Well, this little this little fence here isn't going to do it. Okay. And now he's he, he just thinks it's a garden that's been planted for him. Um, not only is he going to crush it, he's also going to leave behind crushes. They're not good. Um, recycling organic waste uh, to make rich soil amendments is a, is a great idea. You really need to learn how to compost. Um, it increases the organic matter in the soil. It helps add nutrients back to the soil and improves drainage. Um, there's all kinds of wonderful reasons to use compost, but you do need to use it safely. Um, you're using animal manures. They are filled with salmonella and coli, and a lot of the outbreaks that we've had have been because of this. Um, one of the things that we're really looking into is how long does some of this stuff stay viable um, in the in the soil and in the compost and in the manure. Um, and they're finding, you know, 210 days, even though the, the 120 day is the standard for being able to use it and be safe. At 210 days, you're still taking some risks. Um, basically, we say no fresh manure to be used in the garden. It's just not recommended. Um, however, you can uh, compost. Um, composting with manures really is for the experienced composter, but that doesn't mean that you can't compost with your vegetable garden uh, waste and your uh, kitchen waste and that sort of thing. Um, you can still get some really beautiful compost with that, and it's a, so much safer. I just, I just can't emphasize that enough that unless you really know what you're doing, um, buy manure compost um, from somebody who's reputable and should at this point be able to give you a certification that 
their compost has gone through the proper procedures to be safe. Um, we still should make sure that any compost is working to the soil best in the fall. Um, it really should be at least 120 days out if it's going to be leafy greens and those sort of things, 90 days out if, if it's going to be tomatoes or something that's up above. And it should always be incorporated into the soil. We really don't um, have or recommend that you put any sort of uh, cage manure or raw manure for sure directly. Don't side dress, I guess is my point. Um, so work your, work your compost in best and safest. If you don't use compost that, that has manure, um, you know, if you're on a farm and you have it and you know how to do it properly, then, then great. Again, make sure that you're, you're working into the soil in the fall. Cleaning and sanitizing. We have been talking a lot about that this year. So cleaning and sanitizing are two separate things. Okay, cleaning is the removal of soil, debris, that sort of thing. It's getting rid of the dirt. Okay. Sanitizing is then treating that surface to destroy the microorganisms um, or COVID, the co or whatever. Okay. You can't sanitize a dirty surface. Which is why really we emphasize, although we're doing a lot of hand sanitizer these days, it's always best to wash your hands well, clean things well, and then sanitize from there. Um, if you're using sanitizer on a surface that's already dirty, all you're doing is sanitizing a little bit of the dirt, and you're not sanitizing the surface that needs to be um, sanitized. So you need to make sure that you're cleaning, brushing, scrubbing um, your surface, your hands, your tools, um, whatever it is that you're using in that harvesting process. Okay, hand washing. I think we all know how to do that now. And if you haven't, if you don't, you should. Um, again, before and after working in the garden, before um, using and after using the bathroom, anytime we eat in the garden, anytime we drink in the garden, um, anytime we're preparing fruits and vegetables, you really got to think of it as that hand to mouth. Okay, so anytime that would happen, I'm certainly hand to, you know, any, any other fecal matter or whatever that's out there. You, if you find it in the garden and you're removing uh, vegetables that have bird poop or whatever on it, wash your hands after that. Anytime you think they could come into contamination, you need to be washing your hands um, whenever, whenever they're dirty. And, you know, like I said, you definitely hearing a lot about hand washing. We've been preaching this for years in the garden. Um, so we just need to keep keep doing what we're hearing. Uh, um, assist children if they're helping them in the garden. Make sure that they wash their hands really well. You're feeling sick, <laughs> you know. Even when COVID's passed, you're if you're feeling sick, you shouldn't be out there in the garden. Um, you want to make sure that you avoid gardening uh, and cooking when you're not feeling well. You don't want to get anything, uh, you know, into the food or onto the food. Uh, open cuts and sores, you want to keep them clean, keep them covered. Um, the contamination can go both ways. Um, so make sure that if you do get a cut, you know, that you have gloves, um, that you can, you know, clean gloves that you can use. So just a quick little uh, COVID update here since uh, we're kind of talking about it. Um, good news is it's not newborn illness. Um, so it's very uh, unlikely that you're going to get it when you're eating something. Um, it's more uh, of a respiratory thing, so it's it's uh, you everybody knows six feet apart, wearing your masks. Um, so really, if you're working in a community garden, you need to be really conscious of making sure that you're keeping your distance, um, that you're wearing your wax, wax, ugh, wearing your mask at appropriate time, and that we're watching what we're touching. Um, which we should be doing anyway, but just really heighten that um, ability to see where we've been, what are we doing, what are we touching, what's the cross contamination, um, that sort of thing. Uh, bleach could be used to disinfect surfaces. There are a lot of different disinfectants out there. The concentration for COVID is a little bit higher um, than everyday sanitation with the five table cleaners per, per gallon. Um, Bleach does dissipate pretty fast, so really you should only mix up what it is that you need to clean, whatever it is that you're cleaning, you know, for that morning or, or whatever. Um, 
and then it should be disposed of properly and remix next time you need the same again. We're getting down to harvesting. We need to, you know, we clearly want to harvest vegetables when they're, you know, at their peak, um, not when they're past. We want them to last. Um, we want to look at our containers. We want to look at where are we storing our harvesting containers? Is that in a clean area? Is that in an area um, that's most free and the like? And particularly talking about not so much your house right now, but maybe if you're in a demonstration garden or a community garden where maybe they have places that you keep your containers so that they're kind of on site. Is that a clean area? Does it stay clean? What do you need to do to maintain that? Um, your scissors, your knives, um, they should be cleaned beforehand with sanitizing, and they should be cleaned afterwards. You want to make sure that things aren't continuing to grow with, because it has uh, stuff caught between the scissors or on the edge of the oven line. Your counters and your sinks, they should all be cleaned down before you're putting your vegetables onto them. Um, and again, thinking through that whole process, okay, I'm out in the garden. Have, have I done everything that I can? to have germ-free produce, my soil, my water, anything that I'm doing in the garden. Now, I'm going out there to harvest. Is my container clean? Are my hands clean? Are my scissors clean? My knives clean? Am I putting something on the ground? Hmm. Is there holes in the bottom? Am I using a basket with holes? It's clean. You put it on the ground. Now you're getting you know, contamination from down below. So really, you know, and then you're going to bring that in. Are you putting it on your counter? Okay, now you're taking the soil it's on the bottom of your basket. Now it's on your countertop. So thinking about the whole flow, um, at, at East Farm, we've gone with baskets that have closed bottoms, screws, uh, a liner inside. We hit directly into that. Um, then it goes over to our weigh table where it does get put on the right end of the table. And it's taken off the left end of the table and scrub and sanitize the table at the beginning of each um, session. Then it goes down to the left hand side and it, so it sort of makes this loop um, from harvest to getting ready for weighing and, and to, to leave it out um, and then on to when we get busier. Um, later in the season, it goes onto a holding table, which is movable because our uh, shade changes. So we can clean that down and then put, make sure that stays in the shade. So our bags that are, are clean. So really looking at that whole process of preventing as much cross contamination as possible. And when we're out there harvesting, you also want to look for um, produce with open wounds. It's, you know, it's out of there. Um, it's falling on the ground. Same thing. It's, you know, it's out of there. Um, it has pink bird poop, if it has that on it, if there's been deer, if it's half eaten by a chipmunk. Um, just really looking at the produce that you're picking and is that the best produce that you, that you can get. And things that look like our picture here really shouldn't be going to food bank, really you shouldn't be eating them. And I know a lot of people are like, well, it's just, it's just a little bit of mold or a little bit, well, mold and things like that have have legs, basically, you can think of them as, or sort of like a jellyfish, where, you know, the top part is the mold and whatever that you see, and then they have, like, tentacles type of things that might not be using the exact scientific words, but it goes a lot further than you think. Um, so really think twice before just saying, oh, I'll just cut it out, and definitely don't do anything like that to your food. Um, be careful when you're harvesting, that you're not breaking the skin, that you're not making a bruise in between um, when picking, especially again, if you want it to last longer, you want to keep it as fresh as possible. Um, harvest them at the, the right time um, so that they can last as long as possible. Um, and then storing them properly. And I'm not going to get into every type of vegetable and how to store it properly. We have a sheet for that, which I'll show you in just a minute. Um, but as soon as you cut anything, so if you're 
making dinner, you're going to use half that tomato. And although in general, we don't put tomatoes in the refrigerator because it destroys their flavor. And as soon as you cut into that tomato, now you, you, you know, you've injured it. You need to cover it and you need to put it in the refrigerator until you um, are ready to use it um, the next day or whatever. So as soon as you cut anything, it's now refrigerated down. Um, I'm just buzzing through this here. Uh, I'm different, not having an audience to give you feedback. Um, so at this point, um, again, just really thinking through that whole process. Um, have I made in my prep of my garden with my water and my soil as good and safe as possible? Um, with what I'm putting on it for fertilizers and compost, um, is that as safe as possible? With the materials that I'm using, my hands, my knives, my storage containers, is that as safe as possible? And am I cross contaminating? Making sure that you're not. Um, for more information on any of these, there's resources online. Um, again, there's the fruit and vegetable storage back sheet that I talked about. Um, when things are generally ready, and then the top two to five steps on the garden to table review a lot of the same things that we just talked about. Yeah. Well, I guess Vanessa, back to you. Great. So, we had a number of questions. Um, okay. so, if you put your phone on the speaker and just listened. That might help with the sound. It's echoey. Is that better? Hi. <laughs> All right. So I'm gonna... Okay, shoot. What do you got? Okay. The first one, I like this question. So I'm starting with this because I'm a mom. How about kids in the garden? Is there like a specific age you would recommend for how old kids could be when um, in the garden or maybe some recommendations for working with them around food safety? Well, I would say with kids, it's really important to uh, train them early and I think it really depends on the child I mean I would guess it's been a long time since my kids were little um maybe four or five when they can understand things like okay we're going to wash our hands now and tell them why kids love to know why so washing the hands before they go into the garden um then really making sure that they you know point things out um they shouldn't I know we all love to eat out of our garden. We don't recommend that you eat out of your garden because again, just like I was saying earlier, it's that hand to mouth thing. Um, and as soon as you start eating, now you've contaminated your hands. Um, so you really should wash them again. Um, so really teaching those things up front with children, I think is important. They love to see things grow. Um, you teach them how to properly um, be gentle with the, with the fruits and vegetables. If it's your own garden, um, you know, I think you can be a little bit more lenient. If four or five or whatever is really too young to be picking in a community garden or vegetables that you're going to be giving away, just because I think you can't control as much of the way, you know, they handle them. Um, and you really want to make sure that the things are going to the food bank that are just as pristine as you can possibly get. But I would start them early. I mean, I really think it's important. Just Start off with the hey, we're going to wash our hands because we're, we're we're touching food. You know, you would wash your hands before you have lunch, so before you pick up your sandwich. You would wash your hands before you eat your tomato, or before you, you eat your cucumber. Um, well, same thing. You got to think of your produce as ready to eat food. There's some great, great, yeah, great hand washing um, resources from Sesame Street. I must say. <laughs> Um, how about keeping birds out of the garden? We have um, a participant who has a bird who lands on her trellis and leaves gifts that we don't want in the garden. So what, any suggestions for keeping birds out? Okay, well, birds are very difficult. Um, they are. First of all, don't put bird houses up. You know, we love them, they're beautiful, but don't put them up around your vegetable garden. I'm not, I don't know that you have it there. Um, Two things that have worked to at least some extent at, at the um, East Farm Garden. One is whirly gigs do seem to do some. Um, even if you could put them up maybe in your trellis, they, they could be a little tacky. I know that. But the, the motion with the wind, 
Um, those seem to help, particularly if you move them around. Birds and animals get very familiar with um, things that are always the same. So, you know, maybe it's there for a week and then you move it somewhere else. So it's like, oh, something, something new that they need to watch out for. Um, the other thing that East Farm has been doing, and it really only works if you've got a high fence. So if you have your deer fencing up, is we've been putting up fishing line. We're having a lot of problems with crows. And if you ever are down that way, um, there's fine filament fishing line that crosses over the entire top of the garden. We have a very tall fence, so you know we can do that. But they don't like landing on it. They don't like flying into them. It really has helped our crow problem. Um, the other thing that if it's a community garden, generally um, over our harvest table, we have a tent now, which we lower for flyover. Um, so that works well for birds there. It's not going to keep them you know, out of your trellis. Um, and you're not going to want to put a tent over your vegetable garden because clearly now you're blocking all of the sun. But whirly gigs, the, you know, the, the fishing line. And then um, if you're a farm, we always have them take down the bird's nest. It's going to be, you know, try to get them early before there's eggs. Um, as soon as they build the nest, they're clearly going to be going back and forth and leaving presents all over the place. So it depends on how <laughs> you stole my heart. Um, you know, that's up to whether or not that's something that you can do. It is, it is yeah, I think for, it home home them out. for home gardeners, we probably wouldn't want people touching birds' nests and eggs. They are protected by federal law. So we'll, I'm just going to throw <laughs> my ornithology hat on. Um, so yeah, I like the idea of using like something bright and shiny in the garden. So how about moving on? A lot of questions around like sanitizing garden tools. When should we sanitize them? Um, and then questions on like what to use. So one person asked, is alcohol sufficient for cleaning my pruner between different plants? Another person said they're not really interested in using bleach because of um, just various reasons. So can you talk a little bit about like what to use? Okay. so. Um... Remember the first thing that you want to do is make sure that your tools are clean. Okay, so make sure that you clean them, soap and water, rinse them off. Um, you should do that really before and after. That way you're just making sure that things aren't growing on your tools. So clean them first. Um, then if it's a food contact surface, if it's your counter, excuse me, if it's your tools, it should be a food grade um, type of disinfectant which you can get online sometimes we used to be able to get online um they're a lot harder to find these days most of them are out of stock and we can try to get some more for east farm um but yes you can use alcohol um a 70 percent or higher um, alcohol will work on your garden tools um use that in the greenhouse between prunings um to clean off um any bacteria that might be from one plant to another plant um, so you could, you could go ahead and use that, um, and then that's it for your harvesting. I think it's best to do it before and after. Um, is that overkill? I don't know. Maybe if you're just wiping them down afterwards, just to make sure that things aren't caught in them um, and that they're nice and clean before you put them away. Remember too that don't, if you're using like a sheath in the garden for your for your knives or, or your um, scissors, that they should be clean. And before you put them into the sheath, otherwise you're putting dirt and stuff in the sheath. So you clean and cool them and put it back into the dirty sheath. So again, thinking of the cross contamination. I need myself. <laughs> Another question is a lot of questions around like horse manure and is it safe to put it in the garden in the fall? If it hasn't been composted, I'm going to go out and say no. Really, we don't recommend putting raw manure into the garden. Uh, really needs to be composted first, and it really should be composted by by somebody who knows what they're doing. Um, yeah, really don't recommend the use of raw manure there. There's a lot of uh, new guidelines that will be coming down for the farmers around what type of crops they can use even in composted manure um, fields, uh, like maybe not wheat crops or deer 
Um, so really it's leaning that direction. So fresh new and really should just take it off the table. Um, compost it first, um, make sure you can get heat in there and then apply it in the fall, work it into the soil. Um, and let it, let it okay, thank you. Um, another question I had, uh, this is a specific one. Sometimes make squash flowers dipped in egg and pan bread like a pancake sounds delicious. Sometimes they have little garden slugs inside the flour. I soak in cool water and check the insides, but once found I had cooked one in the pancake, is ingesting one dangerous? <laughs> um, I guess I can't say for sure that, yes, it's safe. Um, you know, my dad used to always say it's just extra protein, but, um, you know, you probably want to try to avoid eating the bugs. Um, I don't really have a, a good answer for that. Maybe that's something you can, can look up. Yeah, that's a tough question without knowing the identification of the insect. Um, okay, look for more questions. So there's a lot of like starting to get into more diagnostics questions. So, so could you tell us a little bit about like, how, or I could mention how to um, contact the hotline when you have a diagnostic issue in your vegetable garden, like insects eating your plants. Yeah, I think really that needs to, needs to go to the hotline versus, versus this talk. I'm, I'm not a bug expert. Um, you know, there's, there's some that I know, but it's really much more of the how to keep your produce safe versus growing it that I'm, I'm better at. So you wanna, yeah. Um, do I have a slide that has the hotline? Yeah, I think if you advance the slide one, we should have the hotline there. there and you, you can email the hotline gardener at uri.edu. And what we suggest is take a photo of the damage. Really what we need is a photo of the insect. So sometimes that even means scouting at night and finding the insect or, you know, just taking a look at the undersides and the top sides of the leaves, taking photos, making sure you have something in the photo like a pencil or a coin for scale. Um, and folks will help you diagnose what's going on with your plants using that. Um, we also have a system set up for folks who don't have you know, the ability to email, they may not be on this webinar, but they can um, call our main office, which is down there under general questions 401-874-2900. And we have a few of our volunteers who are answering questions from home who can call people back who are not able to email us, but we do prefer emails this year. Um, okay, let me see if I have any other questions that are not insect related. Oh, here's a question. Uh, I don't know. I missed the first few minutes of the talk. How do I wash the leaf greens as I noticed some eggs on the back side of the leaves? So I guess, um, you know, before eating them, how do you, the leafy greens? I guess if I found eggs on the back of my leafy greens that I was gonna eat, I, I wouldn't eat them. I'd probably just throw that part portion out. Um, if it's on ones that you're not gonna be picking and eating yet, you can squish them so that they don't hatch. Um, but I, I think I probably would just say that when it was, you know, going to the compost. So squish the eggs first and then have them in the compost. Okay, um, here's a very specific one. Someone's relative used five gallon buckets that had been holding motor oil to water his garden. He had cleaned them with gas and then wash them out with detergent, but um, she doesn't think it's safe to eat the greens or squash from his garden. What about tomatoes, beans, or root veggies? It's a tough one. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I would agree with you that I'm not sure if that really got fully cleaned and sanitized enough. Um, I don't really know. I mean, I, I would, really probably refer them to DM for that to ask what the implications might be. Um, I don't I don't really have a lot of expertise on if you had um, gas and oil and stuff in the garden. Sorry. <laughs> okay, we had a question about rain barrels is there anywhere local to get a rain barrel i know there you mentioned that they're not 
not great to use the water from that for vegetables, but um, Wendy could use one for her flowers. I know the Rhode Island Water Lady is no longer in operation, so it's getting harder to find like a local source, but I'm thinking maybe garden centers. Yeah, that's what I would recommend. Yeah, do a, do a search online and see if you can find. But yeah, really, really think about what you're going to be watering with it. If you have no edibles, to be watered. Maybe then there's no water. Okay. Um, okay. Is salt and water a good wash for vegetables before eating, or is there something better? I, I missed the first part of that. The question is, um, you know, should she be using salt and water for cleaning and washing vegetables before eating, or is there something better to wash your vegetables? You should, yeah, you should just wash them with just whatever you would normally wash. I wouldn't necessarily use salt. I don't know if the salt really does anything. Um, a mild, if you feel like you need soap, based on what vegetables that I would use, a fruit and vegetable wash, or just wash them really well, um, you know, in, in, in water. I, I wouldn't, I don't, I don't know why you would use salt. I don't, I'm not familiar with that. Okay, some questions, more questions about like soil pH and testing soil. Um, how often should you test your pH, which I'm happy to answer if you don't want to. I mean, I'm happy you can add in. I mean, I would say at least once a year, if, if your soil has come back fine, um, just to make sure that it's still there. If you're having issues, you're gonna need to do it more than that. Um, you would test it through the recommendation. Um, and then they usually give you, an, you can jump in here and want from this, and they usually give you an amount of time before you testing, depending on what it is that you're adding in, because it does take some time for things to, yeah, I would add that you should get a full soil analysis from UConn or UMass. Um, you know, if you've never had one done, you should definitely do it. You should do it every three years with that full soil analysis, which is going to give you more information on additional amendments to add to your garden. Um, and if you have any lead in the garden, so these are really important things to do. And also if you're renovating a garden bed. Okay, so I'm not sure how to answer this one, but I'm going to throw it <laughs> So Naga says, other than cow manure and Epsom salt, is there any other things that we can use to get better produce? Um, so I think maybe addressing manure again would be good. Yeah, I mean, again, I would say that you know, if you're using manure, if you need to compost it, um, and again, I don't know why I wouldn't necessarily just recommend doing Epsom salts unless there's something came back in your soil test that says, we need to put that in there. Salts aren't necessarily a great thing in the garden. I, I I wouldn't add a lot of non just sort of organic compost type stuff without having a soil test that says yes, I need to add this. And, and again, you shouldn't be using raw manure. Definitely be composting it. Make sure it's thoroughly composted. Put it in the fall. Work it into the soil. Um, there aren't a lot of quick fixes really for soil um, to keep it safe and to, to get it to where it needs to be. It's it's testing, it's amending. Where am I now? But, you know, and that constant you don't end up with perfect soil overnight. And sometimes you know you, that first year is great, and then it's not as good the next couple of years because you're using up a lot of those uh, nutrients. So you know, adding the compost, rotating your crops, doing a lot of the good gardening practices um, to make sure that you're doing everything to improve your soil year after year. It's, it's an ongoing process and, and an ever-changing process. Great. Um, another question. What do you mean when you say you need to compost it about manure? So maybe going over that again, please. Okay. So there you can have, and I think we have, uh, the sage will have some classes online on composting that they could. Yeah, so we will be holding a whole class on composting in the fall. Okay. But just to reiterate what Sue said earlier, um, composting it is the process of kind of adding the brown, the 
the layer of three parts uh, carbon source like leaves um, and then one part nitrogen and then you know adding air by you know moving the compost around and then making sure it's the consistency of a wrung out sponge so those are kind of the some of the basics of the composting um, recipe but really what we're talking about in terms of composting manure that means instead of applying it directly to the garden we want to be putting it through that composting process first if that makes any sense yeah correct so it would be added to your compost pile first and go through the process with your browns and your greens it would be turned um, to a particular heat. Again, so I, when I when you build the compost part of it, you really don't recommend uh, manure use for anybody that's an inexperienced composter. So um, if you don't know how to make compost, you shouldn't be using manure. Okay, this <laughs> is be made to be whatever, okay. but it that's okay. Be safe. I know these aren't easy answers, um, but that's why we have extension so that we can make sure that our population stays safe and healthy. Okay, so another question, does using miracle Grow soil or fertilizer affect the vegetables as far as toxicity or do plants process the chemicals taking up only what they need? I, I'm not a, a fertilizer person. Um, in general, they'll take up what they need, but they'll also take up some other stuff. Like they don't really need, you know, E. coli and stuff too, but they can suck that up. Um, which is why we don't want to be using fresh manure. Uh, I've heard that it leaves salts and stuff behind that you don't necessarily want, but I, I don't know. And they've really changed their formulas, so I, I, I don't want to recommend or not recommend any particular type of fertilizer. The main thing I would say on any fertilizers is do your research, read the directions, apply them the way the directions say. More is not always good. Okay, so really follow the directions on whatever it is that you decide to do. Great. I'm going to only do two more questions and then we can do those end slides. So, one of them is does a couple questions about vinegar. So, um, can you use like white vinegar to wash your, um, your produce? Again, I think we're kind of getting into a little bit of, I mean, it's acidic, so I suppose it has some uh, properties there. But again, I think just really a good washing, if you're doing stuff right to begin with, um, you shouldn't need to use a lot of, I'm <laughs> um, household remedies or that sort of thing. Um, I'm not, and I've read a little bit on, on the vinegars and that sort of thing, but again, just, just really wash them well. If you, if you really feel like you need to wash to a vegetable and something that's made for vegetables would wash. Right, so when you say washing, you mean washing with water. Washing with water. That's right. So good old fashioned water, making sure that's clean water and then you're in good shape. So you don't really need anything in addition. I think that's, that's a good takeaway from today. Um, with one final question about our favorite topic of the day, <laughs> manure again, do you need to compost ra rabbit pellets first? You, you should compost any manure. There are some that are less uh, volatile or whatever than others. Generally, they say that the, the animals that eat grasses and stuff are a little bit better. Your, um, but you still need to compost it. I mean, I guess the bottom line is if it's poop, um, you need to compost it. And you shouldn't be using dog, you shouldn't be using human. That's a whole different, um, whole different ball of wax. Um, but any of your cows, your goats, your your bunny, um, any of that sort of stuff, if you're gonna be using it, you really should be composting it. Thank you, Sue. This was excellent. So uh, this was an excellent overview and a good reminder on a lot of these um, important best practices in terms of food safety. So thank you for sharing all of your information and all the good work you do to get good healthy food out to our community members. I will just mention if you wanna go back a few slides, please Sue, um, that 
if you'd like, if you're interested in learning more science based information about gardening and then sharing that with your community and becoming an educator. Um, we encourage you to apply the online application process is now open until November 1st for next year's training they're held in the spring each year, we are holding a core training. Um, Next year, for sure, it'll likely be some sort of a hybrid option where you'll have some online classes that are really interactive and awesome, some in person and some field experiences. So we invite you to apply and we will give all of the details this fall when we have them um, in hand. And we are having hopefully a satellite location in Providence as well as the Kingston location for the first time this year. So I'm very excited about that. If you wanna um, go to the next slide. Again, there are a lot of ways to learn from master gardeners. We encourage you to check out all of our online gardening resources. If you've never seen the Rhode Island planting calendar that Sue referred to, definitely check that out. That shows you know, when you can do that second round of beans and all of the fall crops that you might wanna be planting in the garden this summer. Um, and when to, to plant things by seed and by seedling or when to start your seeds early in the spring so that um, they're not too leggy. So that's, that's gonna be a good one for all of those beginning gardeners and just a constant reference for you to check out. And that has been recently updated. So again, check out our, our website. Um, definitely make use of the URI Gardening Environmental Hotline. We have volunteers answering questions from home this year. Um, and you just email gardener at uri.edu. We invite you to learn from us at our webinar series this summer. Um, we're gonna continue holding them on Fridays at noon and we'll continue them throughout the fall as well. And again, there's our contact information if you have any general questions. Thank you all for joining us and learning with us as we bring the science to the community of Rhode Island. And thank you again, Sue, for being an incredible instructor. Have a great rest of your day and good, good weekend, everybody. Thank you. You're welcome. It was fun. <laughs>